We're back with Dr. Steve McVeigh today. He's uh, with us. Uh, we're talking about an issue of grace, grace walking. He's got a book called Grace Walk, The Grace Walk Experience. Steve, what are we going to talk about on the show today? We're going to talk about how our troubles can be the best thing that ever happened to us. This is a program for people who have had or are having problems in their life because uh, we're going to discuss how God can use those problems to accomplish a wonderful purpose. Good things can happen. Good things can happen in the midst of our troubles. I believe, you know, Steve, I believe it, but you know what? Often we need to see how that can take place. And I pray that today you'll stay with us and find the grace of God in the middle of our troubles. We are back with uh, Dr. Steve McVeigh today, talking about a book that uh, he really believes, and I, I, I agree with him, is going to make a difference in some people's lives, a huge difference. It's called The Grace Walk Experience. That's really what we're focusing on s this week. You're with me for a week here, Steve. So. I'm always glad to be here with you for a week. Well, thank we have you. a good I appreciate time together. It. What I forgot to do yesterday was tell people where you're from. And you live somewhere in the Tampa Bay area, I understand now. I do. We live down in the Tampa Bay area. and. Uh, we, our ministry and was located in Atlanta, Georgia, and, and we for lived years. there for a lot of years. Yeah. People ask me, well, why did you move to Florida? And I said, well, because I could. <laughs> <laughs> my, my kids are grown, and as long as there's an airport for me to get into and fly out and a word processor nearby where I can keep riding, it doesn't matter where I live. So we moved to sunny Florida just because we enjoy because that area. Could. Because yeah. you could. That's and right. Because you enjoy That's the right. area. That's right. Well, that is so cool. Well, good for you. And your, your, your children, you have four children. I have four children, two sons and two daughters. As I said, they're all grown. We have three grandchildren, and uh, we're loving life. My wife, Melanie, travels with me um, most all of the time, 95% of the time. She travels with me, and uh, we do ministry just everywhere. Uh, in fact, I, I, I mentioned our website late yesterday. Let me mention our website again, gracewalk.org. Folks can visit our website and, and there learn about what we're doing in missions. We're reaching out into China, Korea, Japan, all over Latin America. Grace Walk Mexico for Spanish-speaking people. We have a Mexican, I mean a Spanish uh, website, Caminando Bajo Su Gracia uh, dot, uh, dot com, and uh, they can visit that and uh, just find out. God's just, you know, people are hungry for this message, Willard. That's what it is. People are hungry. My first book, Grace Walk, it will go into its 10th language this summer. A Danish will be language number 10. That amazes me. And I don't say that to boast. I say that to say, to, to, to evidence the fact people want to know the truth of how to experience freedom and how to enjoy their faith. It's about enjoying their walk with it's God. It's about it? enjoying it. Jesus said, I've come to give you life so that you'll have it abundantly. But man, if you look at folks in the average church, it doesn't exactly look like they're enjoying an abundant lifestyle. And I didn't for a lot of years. I was sincere, but I saw a great gap between the joy that Jesus said he wanted to leave us. He said, you know, my joy I give to you. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, I pray that my joy will be fulfilled in them. Well, I didn't see that in my own life. I was sincere, but I was driving myself into the ground trying to do something that never would have succeeded. So, so it all, like our walk in Jesus starts off when we just simply embrace him, invite him into our, li into our lives, and literally receive his life. It's an exchange life. I, you know, I, I like... What it says in Galatians, I think it's chapter 2, verse 20, where it says, It's no longer I that live, but Christ who lives in me, and the life I now live that's by right. faith in him who loved me and gave his life. I mean, I, th that's one of the first verses that I learned as a five-year-old. Yeah, and what a wonderful verse. And that's right. What I call the grace walk is, is what Hudson Taylor is the one that coined that phrase, the exchange life. And that's a good phrase, the exchange life. It's just, as you said in Galatians 2.20, it's the idea and understanding that when we receive the life of Christ, he takes the old person that we were and he replaces that with his life. So it's an exchange life. And it isn't something we always recognize. I mean, it, we get distracted from it so easily in our, in our religious walk. Absolutely. In, in, our, in our wanting to serve God and wanting to do better and That's so right. on. We don't know what we have, and that's the big thing. We don't really understand sometimes what we have. Yeah. I remember some time ago, I said we lived in Florida, and one day I was looking for my sunglasses, and I said, I thought I left them in here on my desk at home, and I looked in there, and my sunglasses weren't there. 
I went back in the living room and looked by my recliner. They weren't there. I looked where I keep my keys. They weren't there. I went into the bedroom, and I'm becoming more and more frustrated. Where are my sunglasses? I'm looking everywhere. I can't find them. Where did I put those things? And I think, well, could I carry them into the bathroom? So I go into the bathroom and look in there, and I glance up into the mirror, and there they are right on top of my head where I've pulled them back off my eyes. I'm looking everywhere trying to find something that I'm carrying around with me. And I thought, well, you know, that's a pretty good example of what I did as a Christian for a lot of years. A lot of us are trying to find something that we already have. We're trying to find a victory that's already ours in Jesus Christ. That's why I wrote the Grace Walk Experience, to present these eight truths in this book that will enable people to understand what we're looking for we already have in the person of Jesus. All we need to know is how to appropriate by faith the reality of the indwelling Christ, and we'll experience okay. what God wants us to know and enjoy. Oh, that's good. <laughs> okay, and yesterday on the program, as we were concluding the program, you promised you're going to tell us something today on the show about this experience, because I think the chapter we're going into today is the whole area of uh, uh, difficulties that come into our lives. Some of the most difficult things that come into our lives can be actually a doorway, I think, of God working that's right. something of himself into us. That's right. Yesterday in, in, in chapter 1, we talked about improving your behavior will not give you victory in the Christian life. That's the first truth people need to know to, set, to be set so, free. So, so that all of the do's and don'ts and keeping all the do's and right. not doing all the don'ts right. will not give you victory. It'll make, you can still be miserable. You can do all the do's and don't all the don'ts and you'll still be miserable because improving your behavior is not the key to enjoying the Christian walk. Understanding who you are in Christ is the key. And today, <coughs> uh, chapter number two is this. Problems in your life could be the best thing that could happen to you. Problems in your life could be the best thing that could happen to you. Um, and I promised yesterday that I would, I would tell... You, you, yeah, you tell us a story here. Then I'd, I'd tell you a short story. And I've told it before. Some that may have seen me here in years past might have heard this. I'll give the short version. But it was on October 6, 1990, that I was lying on my face in my office. I'd been a pastor at that time for 29 years. And I was lying there crying at 2 in the morning. And I said, God, if this, is the Christ if this is ministry, I want out. I said, in fact, if this is the Christian life, it's overrated. It's great for getting you into heaven. But in the meantime, what's the big deal? I don't see the abundance. I don't see the victory. I, I look at the lives of people in the New Testament. There's a far, far cry between my lifestyle and theirs, a big gap between the two. And I was lying on my face crying and saying, God, what are you doing? Are you sadistic? You know, and the reason I was doing that is because uh, he had put me in a, in, a, in a church that had been declining. Now, I was a local church pastor. It had been declining for five years, but everywhere I had ever served, churches had grown. And after a year in that church, it was to, the next day on a Sunday was to be my first anniversary date. But instead of growing, the church had continued to decline. And I had become more and more discouraged until I finally became depressed. On October 6, 1990, I reached a place of despair. And I was lying there, and, and I, I said, God, if this is it, if this is all there is to it, I don't, get, I don't understand what the big deal mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. And I came to the end of myself that night, Willard, and I began to pray and just systematically in my prayer empty myself of everything that had given me a sense of, of value, everything that had given me a sense of, of purpose and meaning, and it's like okay. I... And the things that you'd kind of relied on, things that you had put value in or something I, like I, that. That's exactly it. I, I, said, I prayed like this. I said things like, Lord, uh, you know, from now on, you know, um, I'm not, I give up. I, I acknowledge that my background in ministry means nothing. My education, it has no value in terms of me depending on that. My abilities or gifts that I might have, that means nothing. Everything I've been clinging to to try to make my life work, you know, I acknowledge that that that's not where life is to be found. And I empty myself. And I, I come to the place, Father, where I say that I quit my ministry. This is your ministry. It's called absolute surrender, taking your hands off your own life. I quit my ministry. This is your ministry. And if you want to bless and cause it to succeed, fine. But if it continues to fail, then it's your responsibility. And in, in fact, I said, Lord, in terms of me trying to live the Christian life, I've lived on this motivation, condemnation, rededication cycle for 29 years, and I'm tired of it. I'm going to quit trying. I said, I'm not going to rededicate myself to try harder anymore because it doesn't work. And you know, Willard, I don't want to breeze right past that because that's, that is a truth a lot, of, a lot of folks don't get. 
rededicating yourself to try harder to live for God won't work. So, so like the, the, the January 1st thing of making new commitments for the coming year, making my pledge for the new year, this is not the way. I mean, and we do that week by week often as Christians. Every That's Sunday, right. As Sunday we go to church and say, whoa, I really blew it last week, but I really don't want to. I'm going to do better I'm going to try week. harder. I'll try harder That's next right. week. We do it all the time, but the key to victory in the Christian walk is not trying harder. The key is in trusting Him. Let me tell you what God wants to bring us to, and this is, this is, this is uh, just right in this second chapter, and, and that is problems may be the best thing that could ever happen to us. The place we need to come to is where we say, you know what, Father, I'm going to quit trying. I, I'm not going to read. Listen, we're not called to rededicate ourselves to Him. The Bible tells us we're to renounce the self-life. Jesus speaking said, if any man will follow me, let him take up his cross, dedicate himself, and follow me. And, and follow me. Is that what he said? No. No, he didn't say, and did you catch it, those watching? <laughs> no. I'll say the verse again. You, so you're sharp, you caught it. If any man will come after me, let him dedicate himself, take up his cross, and follow me. That's not what he said. What did he say? He let said, him, take, lay down his life. That's right. Let him deny himself. Deny himself, yeah. Lay down his life. Just lay down your life. You don't, you don't rededicate self. You renounce self. And the thing that God does with problems is he uses those problems to become our best friend. Second chapter, Prob your problems may be the best thing that could ever happen to you, that have ever happened to you. Because problems become a messenger that God uses to bring us to the end of ourselves and to cause us once and for all to realize that we don't have to try harder. Instead, we just need to give up. I used to pray prayers like this. Lord, make me stronger, make me stronger. Oh, God, please make me stronger. When in reality, my problem was, I was already too strong. You see, we don't get strong enough for God to use. We have to get weak enough for God to use us. <laughs> it's, 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 okay, keep going, because that's this is a toughie for us. And see, what we do, and this is the lie of modern religion, in the Christian church, in the Christian church, there is, there's a false bill of goods being sold to us, and we're believing the lie. And if truth sets you free, you know what lies will do to you. Lies will keep you in bondage. And the, the, the enemy of our souls is not stupid. He's not going to give us lies that are so blatantly obvious that we'll reject them. He's going to make them sound religious and make them sound right so we fall for them. And here is the lie. The lie is, the lie is, well, you just need to suck it up and, and, and promise, you know, try harder and promise God you'll do better. Go out. All God, how many times have you heard this? God just expects your best. All he wants is that you do your best and try your hardest. Those are all lies. All lies. And they'll keep you in bondage. And I want to say to those that are watching for a minute, if you believe the things I've just said are not lies, then why don't they work for you? And I, I'm bold enough to say it. I tried for 29 years. Nobody could have been more sincere than, than I was. And, this, and I think it's accurate to say if, if trying and sincerity in, in our efforts to live the Christian life was the key, then we'd be living in the millennial reign right now, wouldn't we? Because God knows we've all tried. But we don't need to try. We need to trust. Steve, you're flying in the face of some pretty important uh, or some people I mean, if I'm, if I, if I'm hearing you, if, if, so, so shoot me down if I'm wrong, if I'm, right. if I'm saying something wrong here. But, but our excellence is all God's asking for. I mean, there is so much excellence we talk about in the church today. Mm -hmm. Okay, keep going. I'm not, no, no, I'm not. No, 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 I'm just saying, you know, as long as we become excellent. Oh, yeah, that's what we're told. I mean, I'm, I'm serious. You know, we're, we're striving towards excellence. That's right. Everywhere. In the church today. That's right. And let me give you a verse that counteracts this, this, this idea that we must strive toward excellence through our performance. It is Ephesians. You are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God in advance has ordained or that you should walk in them. You are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. That's Ephesians 2.10. The word workmanship there, the Greek word poema, means poem, a piece of poetry, you are already excellent. I am already excellent. We don't strive to become excellent by our performance. <coughs> but instead, we are to understand that God has created us in his image. And that in the person of Jesus and the finished work of the cross, we have been given the good housekeeping seal of approval by God himself saying, A1, excellent. 
And what we need is to understand who we already are and live from out of that. And then our behavior, our activity, will reflect the excellence that resides within us. That's very different from what we hear in the modern church, which is you become excellent by the things you do, by, by raising the bar and improving your standard of excellence. Do, do, do you hear I, the difference between difference the two? There. I, I hear what you're saying. Because it's not that... I mean, I, I, I love what you said when he made us and he put his stamp of approval on us. We are made accepted in the beloved. Listen, I love this in Jack and Genesis when God made something. Every time God made something, it says he looked at it and he said, It's good. It's good. Yeah. It's good. And when he looked at Jesus at his baptism, the father watching, watching couldn't contain himself. And he says, I'm not just going to say it. I want them to hear it. And so he pulled back and separated the curtain. And he leaned over and said, this is my son, and I'm well pleased. And everybody heard it. And that's what he does with you and me. We don't have to jump through the hoops to try to gain his approval. We must understand that, that in Jesus Christ, it's all been done. And we are as acceptable to God right now as Christ is. And what, no, what our no. Father wants to do is take us off of this insanity, out of this insanity of trying and trying and trying to do something for ourselves that in reality He's already done he's on done, our yeah, behalf. Yeah. As though we're trying to go and improve on something yeah. He's done better than we'll ever be able to do. And He uses problems to cause us to realize it's not going to work no matter how hard you try. But you know, when you talk about the approval that God has for, for, for Jesus, you know, that, that saying that. Uh, Betty came to me one day about a year and a half ago or so, uh, maybe it's even two years ago, and she said, Willard, I was looking at the book of John, reading it, reading it, and reading it, because God wanted to talk to me. And she said, I wasn't, I'm trying to absorb it. You know, you know sometimes you know that God's saying you just, you're, you're, and she was just at one of those times in her life where she just, and, and out of it, out of the blue, she said as she was reading that again, in, in the book of John, she realized that, that the Father spoke that of Jesus before he did one lick of work. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And we, we you, know, you know, it wasn't after he had done all these things and died on the cross. That's it, great. That's I, a good, and that was very powerful. That's a great observation. It, it got, yeah, it, it blew me away because I'd never observed that. Uh -huh. And I thought, Betty, you know what? You just got a revelation there of, from the Father. That's awesome. Therefore, then, the work and the ministry of Jesus flowed out of the acceptance that he already had from his father, didn't it? It did. And that's right. And that's the way we were to be. Yeah. But we get it so backwards in the church. And, we're, and, and, and listen, I'm not being critical of the modern church because I want to make sure those watching know I was a local church pastor for 21 years, and I still speak 98% of the time in local churches. I'm not trying to, 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 to be critical of the church. I love the church of Jesus Christ. And, and I speak as a fellow traveler in this journey yeah, within sure. the church to yeah. say, let's, let's embrace and realize the truth. And here's an important question I think we all need to ask in ourselves and, and, and honestly answer. Am I willing to change the way I see things? Am I willing to, to, to come to a place? Am I still teachable? And am I willing to say, you know what, what I've always but, believed is wrong and what my church teaches me is wrong and what I've preached or taught as a pastor yeah, is wrong. wrong. Yeah. I'm willing to be but, changed. My struggle, Steve, is that I fall back into that myself. I mean, I know what you're saying is true. I know that that's what the Bible speaks about, mm -hmm. that I'm seated in Christ in heavenly places mm -hmm. today. Colossians 3, mm -hmm. chapter, or chapter 3, verses 1, or yeah, 1, 2, 3, 4. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it says, I'm looking down from mm -hmm. that place of sitting on the throne in Jesus. Mm -hmm. And I don't see my world that way when I know it's true, okay? Because mm -hmm. I get caught again in seeing myself from a different point of view. And I've got to get my refocusing done. It's a matter of renewing our minds. And that mind renewal is an, is an ongoing everyday thing with us because most of us, especially those of us who've grown up in the church, we've been so programmed by the teaching that we receive to think that it's all about us and what we do, I know. Yeah. that to, to, to reverse that and say, no, it's about him and what he's already done, that, that takes some... Can I, I'm going to throw something else out, Steve, just in view of what you said. Mm -hmm. 
I don't know that it's always that you have to have been in a church background. That's to a have good it. point. I, it really comes out. from the Garden of Eden, doesn't it? Because it, it comes out of the, the our, our, our human nature is used by the enemy of our mm-hmm. souls mm-hmm. To, to reach it because we there's something in us that feels we can improve ourselves. There's mm-hmm. something mm-hmm. in our very nature. So, mm-hmm. you know, the way we heard it, and if, if we grew up in a church, we heard that because it came out of human nature That's there. That's a good point. If it comes, yeah. I, I've seen people that have never had no church background mm-hmm. get born again, mm-hmm. get saved, get, you know, receive Jesus by faith, and you know, shortly thereafter, they get caught in this themselves mm-hmm. because we're all prone to it. I think it's... A <laughs> We're prone. <laughs> well, that's it's, right. It's something that's built into us. All the way back in the Garden of Eden, as soon yeah. as, Adam, as Adam and Eve sinned and they saw their def- that what they perceived to be a deficiency, what did they do? Yeah. They went out and by their own efforts, they took leaves and made and coverings for cover themselves, themselves and trying to make themselves presentable by what they did. Yeah. And you're right. You're right. We're born hardwired with that when we're born into Adam. I think so. But I, when we come into Christ, it's a whole, it, it, it turns it, it, everything else upside down. If I live out of Christ, that won't be there. Anyway, I need to take a little break okay. and we'll come back okay. right after this. We're talking to Steve uh, McVeigh. The book is The Grace Walk Experience. You can get it from him at his website. And we get a number, an address on the screen. You can go there as well. We'll take a break and be right back with uh, Steve right after this. We're back with Dr. Steve McVeigh. Uh, and we're, we're talking about uh, some of the, the subject matter in this book, which is The Grace Walk Experience, is how do you live out? This is really what it's all about. Yeah. How do you live out and enjoy your life the way God intends it is for eight you to do it? Truths that I, I, I'll be so bold as to say eight truths that may well transform your life. And I say that from my own experience, and not only my, because my life has been transformed by understanding these eight truths, but I get email from people all over the world mm-hmm. who have said, wow, I went through this and my life was transformed. By the way, can I say this? Something we sure. didn't mention. I also have video and audio teachings to go along with this. Okay, okay. so somebody will find them on the website. Absolutely. A lot of this is being used in small groups. I've got eight 30-minute teachings, video teachings that go along with with each of these sessions. Okay. Gracewalk.org. How about, how's that for a shameless hey, plug? That, that, that's, a, that's a great one. I'm okay with that. But, but yesterday we talked about the, the reality that, you know, your behavior, doing right and wrong things, yeah. d- it doesn't make you get any more victorious. I mean, that was, we dealt with that yesterday. That's right. Today we're talking about the fact that uh, difficult things may come. God will use tough things in your life. I mean, I, I forget how you actually your, put that your, in the statement. Problems may be the best thing. Well, how did the I best say it? Thing, The said, best thing that could ever happen to you. The that could ever happen to you is a problem. That's right. That's right. Okay. Problems yeah. may be the best thing that could ever happen to you. Right. That's how you, that's you put it, it down. Yeah. Okay. Let, let me give you a, a verse. Let's go there. Second, I mean, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8. Well, let me preface reading the verse. Let, let me tease this a little bit before I read it in the verse. I love to say things that people say, that's wrong, I don't agree with that, and then show it to them in the Bible. Okay. Because here's, the, here's a point I want to make, kind of parenthetically, Willard. Some of the things we, have, we believe, we have heard them said so many times that we believe they're true. We think they're true just because we've heard it so many times. We think it's true because we grew up hearing it. Some mm-hmm. things people mm-hmm. think are in the That's Bible. True. You know, you find out later Benjamin Franklin said, you know, things like God help <laughs> those who help themselves. You know, things that are, people well, think that are in the Bible. Y- I was going to say, you mean that's <laughs> not in the Bible? Because yeah. I've heard that so many times. Yeah, exactly. Things that we think are biblical that are so not biblical, but we've heard it so many times we think it's from the Bible. Now, one of the things that we've all heard many times in our lives, we're talking about how problems can become your best friend, be the best thing that ever happened to you. One of the things we've all heard is God will never put a burden on you greater than you can bear. We've all heard it. I've, I've heard said it, it when, before I knew better. I used to teach it. I used to say it. I believed it. But I'm going to tell you. Now, don't, don't, don't get mad at me because I'm going to show you this in the Bible. I don't. The, 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 let me re- make the statement again. God will not put any burdens on you greater than you can bear. I'm here to tell you that's a lie. God will put burdens on you greater than you greater can bear. Greater than you can bear? Better, yeah. Now, I know every Sunday school teacher in, in Canada is looking at this saying, wait, wait a minute, I don't agree with that. <laughs> what about 1 Corinthians 10, 13? Exactly. God will not allow you to be tempted above that which you are able. I am not talking about temptation to sin. That verse does say that God will not allow you to be tempted to sin to an extent beyond that which you can resist. But he will with the temptation, make a way of escape, the verse says. Okay, what, so in other words, there is a way out. When you're tempted, there's there always is, a way you can out. always say no. And the way out is always the same. It's Jesus, by the way. Oh, it's, it's, it's Jesus. The way is it? always, he's, he is the way. I am the way. So he says, God will not allow you to be tempted, tested, tempted to sin, tested oh, in the area of sin, 
more than you can bear, but he'll always make a way of escape, and the way is Jesus. Jesus but is the way of escape. He's the way of okay, escape. Okay, but now, good, okay, but okay. we're not talking but about that, temptation not, to yeah. sin. Okay. We're talking about burdens, trials, troubles, weight, pressure. Now, I said, and I, let me recap, and then we'll come to the Bible. I said, God will allow you to have burdens greater than you can bear. Now, let's prove it from Scripture before folks change the channel. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. I'm sorry, 2 yeah. Corinthians chapter right. 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul was writing to the church at Corinth about his experience, and here's what he said, verse 8. Now, I'm reading straight from Scripture, 2 Corinthians 1, 8. We do not want you to be unaware, brethren, of our affliction which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened excessively beyond our strength, so that we despaired even of life. Verse 9, indeed, we had the sentence of death within ourselves, so that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. Now, let me say two things. Number one, I just told folks watching on TV that God will allow you to have burdens that are greater than you can bear. Number two, listen to number two, look at your own Bible. Don't you dare sit there and say, I just disagree with him about that. Get it. <laughs> look in your Bible. Second Corinthians 1, 8 and 9. I go back to what I said. Are we willing to have our mind changed if we see something in Scripture? Now let's look at these verses. Paul said, when I was in Asia, he said, I had a burden. This yeah, is verse 8. That's right. It wasn't just a burden. It was an excessive burden. But then here's the next phrase. Beyond our strength. This is, I'm reading this from the New American Standard. Mm -hmm. But... The New International Version, which is not my favorite version, but in this verse it does a good job. The New International Version in 2 Corinthians 1.8 says, We were burdened, here's the quote, beyond our ability to endure. Making it very clear. I mean, does it get any plainer than that? Yeah, yeah. Paul said, I had a burden when I was in Asia that was so excessive, it was beyond my ability to endure it. It was greater than I could bear. There it is, right in the Bible. Now, lest you think, well, he might have meant something else by that, listen to He goes on and says, so that we despaired even of life. Now, let's put that in modern English. What's he really saying? Well, I mean, I, 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 give, I give up living. I, I, mean, I just I, wish I, I could I, die. I wish I could die. Exactly. And who hasn't said that? I mean, That's right. I'll bet, it, I'll bet there's a lot of people watching the show today that have been in circumstances somewhere in their life that said, you know what? I'd just like to die. That I'd like amen. to be out of here. We've all been there. And, and, and those watching this show, if, if, if you've ever got to a place where you say, you know, I just don't know how I can bear this. It seems like it's more than I can bear, and, and I just wish I could die. Well, you're, on good, you're, you're in good company because yeah. the Apostle Paul said that. But wait, wait. He didn't stop there. Oh, okay. He goes on and says, indeed, we had the sentence of death in ourselves. In other words, it's like my whole life, it's like it's got the kiss of death on it. So now look at the, yeah, look at the progression. He's, so he wants to make it very clear so he's redundant. He repeats himself again and again. I had a burden. It was an excessive burden. It was greater than I could bear. It made me wish I could die. I had the kiss of death on myself. Why would God do that? Here it is, verse 9, 2 Corinthians 1, 9. In order that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. Now, here's the complete thought. I said God will put more on you yeah, than you, than can, you bear. can bear. Yeah. The complete thought is God will put more on you than you can bear so that we come to the place where we realize that he will bear it for us so that we will come to the place where we give up confidence in our own self-sufficiency. That is why problems can be the best thing that ever happens to us. See, I mentioned earlier in the show how that on October 6, 1990, I was lying on my face and saying, God, you know, I, yeah, I, I, yeah. This, is, this is, the Christian life is overrated. I'm quitting ministry if this is all yeah. there is to it. I even said, Lord, why don't you just let me die and take me to heaven? But that was a good thing. I look back now and say, that dark night of my soul was one of the mountain peaks of my Christian walk because it, remember I said earlier yep, that said I that, prayed right? and I emptied myself? Mm -hmm. It brought me to the end of myself. It is for that reason that our problems can become the best thing that ever happens to us. Instead of looking for God to bring us through and out of our troubles, we need to be asking, Lord, what is it that you're seeking to accomplish in my life in the midst of these troubles? And the answer may well be what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 1, 8 and 9. God may answer, I'm working in you to bring you to the place so that you would not trust in yourself, but in God, in me, the one who raises from the dead. So for, can you see then how yep. trouble, troubles can be our best friend? Yeah. 
But, but, but how, many, how, many, how many circles in the modern church tell you that if you're having troubles and if you're hurting, then you must not have enough faith? Oh, I hate that. The ministering <laughs> death to people. Don't get me started. Oh, man. Yeah, yeah, don't, yeah. I, don't get me started. Ministries and, and teachers and preachers of the Bible that tell you that if you acknowledge that you're hurting, that you're having problems, that you're struggling, that you're in pain, don't make those negative confessions. Tell it to the Apostle Paul. Yeah, tell, try that on with the Apostle Paul. I had burdens. They were excessive. They were more than I could bear. I despaired of life. I had the sentence of death. You know and I know there are ministries right now that would have said to Paul himself, stop with those negative confessions. No, Paul wasn't making a negative confession. He was being honest about how he felt at the time and what his experience was. Right, he did. And he wrapped it all up by saying, but God was allowing it. God was behind the scenes using it to bring me to the end of myself so that I would not trust in myself, but in the one who raises from the dead. The, the, the area is trust, isn't it? It's, it's, it's where your reliance comes. It's when, you, when you're relying on you, you're in trouble. Absolutely. When you're relying on God to work out the next step, whatever that looks like. And, and often it gets us to the place we don't know what the next step is. Let me tell you the thing that God is wanting to do is bring us to the place where we give up and say, I yield everything into your hands. I remember October 6, 1990 when I was on my face. Yeah, yeah okay. I said, before that night was over, I said, Lord, I, from now on, everything is you. It's all you. And I said, Father, for every positive thing that feels good and that I like in my life from this day forward, I'm going to tell everybody, it's him. It's all him. And I said, but Lord, for every painful negative thing that happens in my life from now on, I'm going to say, it's him. It's him. It's all him. <laughs> Because I said it's not my life anymore. I said, Lord, if yes, I'm going to give you the credit, okay, I'm going to okay. give you the blame. Okay. And, and see, somehow we think that's unspiritual. <laughs> you know, I, that's exactly the point. We want to take the blame for all the bad stuff and yeah. say it's us. Who, who put God on the Isle of Patmos? Uh, who, or John? Who, who, who John, put, who put John, John on the Isle of Patmos? Yeah, God, God did. did. Yeah, God, who let yeah. Daniel go to that lion's den? Yeah, God, God did. God allowed Daniel with the lion's den. You know, that's a t that's a struggle for some of us. Yeah, though. we can't. And, but you know what that would do if we would understand the sovereignty of God over our lives, even in our pain and problems. What it would do is it would give us a sense of peace in those problems. Rest. Yeah. A rest and say, yeah. I don't know what the Lord's doing, but I know the Lord is sovereign and he's over my life and he's behind everything. I'm not saying God causes people to sin against us, but I'm saying that even that God stands behind and uses. When Joseph's brother sold him into I, slavery, I know. I know. did he, God make him do that? No. But later, what did Joseph say? When his brothers came, he said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Well, well you, you know, I've looked at that, that Joseph story. Is, uh, yeah, and these are, there are principles of God that you find throughout the Bible in the stories. Because, I mean, how do you find the, the ways of God except through the stories we've got? That's right. Uh, but in Joseph's case, I mean, when Joseph had those dreams, the destiny of those dreams meant he had to be sold into slavery. That's right. Because how was he going to get to Pharaoh's court? That's right. How was he going to get there? How was he going to be the one that they would bow down to? That's right. Unless he was sold into, unless one of his brothers says, we're going to kill a kid. Mm -hmm. And somebody says, no, we're not going to kill a kid. I mean, you, you know what? I mean, that's right. You've got to let go of that. You've got to say, you know what? God's bigger than this. That's right. Well, you know, when I was on my face on October 6, 1990, praying and thinking of getting out of the ministry and trying to figure out how and saying, God, this Christian life is overrated. It was the darkest moment of my life, but I, went, I would go on to write about it in my book, Grace Walk, and even in this book, The Grace Walk Experience. And now, through that first book, Grace Walk, 10 languages all over yeah, the world. Right, exactly, exactly. That never would have happened if God had not allowed me to lie on my face saying, if this is it, I want out. And, and, and for you to pastor a church that's yeah. going downhill every down, step down, of the down, way. Down, down. A whole year of going downhill. And I'm saying, God, what are you doing? What are you doing? And God says, I'm doing what I'm doing. And I understand, and you don't. I think it was D.L. Moody, I believe that's the one that said, when you can't trace his hand, trust his heart. Trust his heart, yeah. I think Moody does. Yeah, but, but look at Job. I mean, isn't Job a situation where, 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 where Job is in a place like, like n nobody understands what Job's going through, but Job's going through despair. I mean, I, Absolutely. I mean he's going through what Paul writes about in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8. I, I actually, I, I, in, a, in, in, in the second chapter here, I forget which day, we talk about Job. Listen to the way Job described it. Now, we know Job was an upright man. The Bible says so. And people say he was, you know, it was because he, what he feared came upon him. And I'm just saying... 
D don't don't hang everything on the fact that it says what he feared came upon. I I just God had a plan. I have feared things that did not come upon me. I have feared more things that didn't come upon me than That's things right. that did. Okay. And I have had things come upon me that, that never, I never occurred feared. to me to fear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So so don't make that a rule that That's that right. gives people the excuse to hang at and say, well, I'm not going to fear any. I mean, you, they, you know what people want to do in the story of Job? They want to blame Job. Yes, they do. And let me tell and, you, and who, the, let yeah. me tell you where the blame rests. And this, this is going to rock some folks. I, I'm not crazy. Some people don't like what I'm saying now. I know that. But let me tell you, don't blame Job. Blame God. Because when Job, when Job blamed, God, blamed God for his circumstances, God said, where were you when I drew the line in the sand and said to the ocean, you could come so far and no further? Where were you when I hung the stars in the sky? Where were you when? Where were you when? And what God was saying to Job is, I know what I'm doing. So your role is to trust. But now Job did. Listen to this. Yes, Job yeah. 23. Can I read this sure, passage? Go ahead. Here, here's Job's declaration of what he was feeling. He said, my complaint is bitter. God's hand is heavy despite all my groaning. This is Job 23. Oh, that I knew where I might find God. I'd come to a seat and present my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. I would want to know the words he'd answer and understand what he'd say to me. And then he goes down and says, uh, verse 8, I go forward, this is Job 23, but I, he's not there. Backward, but I can't perceive him. When he acts on the left hand, I can't see him. He, when he turns on the right, I can't see him. But listen to verse 10. But God knows the way that I take. And when he's tried me, I'll come forth as gold. That's Job 23, verses 1 through 10. Job was in a horrible circumstance. But in verse 10, he said, but God knows the way that I take. And here's the hope for those of you that are going through yeah. troubles that are listening to us right now. Yeah. You may not know what in the world is going on in your life. That's it. But don't quit rebuking the devil in it. And quit, quit doubting God in the midst. And quit blaming yourself in it. And say, God, I'm yours. And you're mine. And you're sovereign. And, and you can yeah. stop this in the moment. And I don't have the answers. And I don't have the answers and don't have to have the answers. But the key is for us I to say, Lord, you. you're the one in control. And I just yield to you. I, I think, you know, that is really the secret, isn't it? God, you're in control. Do we really believe that? Th that's the challenge. But don't you agree uh, that we tend to want to blame the devil? Absolutely. We tend to want to blame ourselves. We tend to want to blame other people. Let me tell you, when it comes to God, we can say the buck stops here. <laughs> yeah. I, it, it's a, I, I don't want to be misunderstood, Willard. I'm not saying that God will cause somebody to do something evil against you, but I'm saying God is bigger than the evil that somebody does against you. He's bigger than the bad things that happen to you in this life. And he can turn that thing around and use it for his glory and your good, and he will. So no matter what's going on, if we're going through torment and trials that we brought upon ourselves, and a lot of people watching would say that, oh, but it's my own stupid mistakes that put me here. I love what the psalmist said. He said, even if I make my bed in hell, what's the rest? Wow. That he, thou art yeah, with thou art me. With, so, yeah, you know, that's interesting. I made the bed. I made the bed. I, so I got to sleep in it. Yeah, I, mean, I, I, mean, yeah, I haven't well, we I heard, heard of that, that too. one. Hell, yeah. he made his bed. Let him sleep let him in sleep. it. <laughs> but, but the psalmist said, even if I make my bed in hell, you are with me. You won't forsake me even there. You see, you see, it's this trust in God. Like, you see, bad things happen, but is your trust in God in the middle of bad things? Bad things but, happen sometimes because of my own foolishness. Bad things happen sometimes because other people do Some, a wrong thing Somebody else did me. stupid things. I know. Bad things driver, happen yeah. sometimes for no reason that I can make any sense out of or even understand the cause. But it doesn't matter. When bad things happen, our problems may be the best thing that could ever happen to us. That's what chapter 2 is about. In five days, we study that in this chapter as to how God will use it to accomplish His purpose in our lives and how we're to respond to it when we're going through it. So there is, there, our response is really trust. A, is always trust. Always trust. People say, well, what's my part and what God's, what's God's part? Here it is. God's part is to be in charge. My part is to trust Him. The Lord spoke to me one day. I was agonizing over something in prayer. And the Lord, you ever have the Lord just kind of, the Lord speaks in a lot of ways and mm -hmm. certainly in, in, in Scripture and never in a way that will contradict Scripture. But sometimes the Lord just gives you an understanding and He speaks to you that it's way. It's true. It's true. And I remember one day I was agonizing over something and I was praying and I was waiting for the Lord and it's like the Lord spoke in my mind, that this realization come to me. And he said, Steve, I am, he said, you are not suited for being in control. While I, on the other hand, am perfectly suited for it. And then the Lord said to me, you create needless problems for yourself when you get our two roles confused. Wow. And oh, how, and wow. that just uh, that washed over me. I said, Lord, yeah. boy, did you nail me on that? Because... 
When I'm in yeah. trouble, and I, I think, we, it, again, we all, our flesh, we tend to be this way. When I'm in trouble, I want to solve that problem. I'm the kind of guy that says, people say, well, you might be jumping out of the pan into the fire. You know my, the way I'm wired, my personality? Then let me jump in the fire. <laughs> that's right. I'd rather yeah. jump in the fire. I can't stand but I this being in something. the pan. I want to do and something. Yeah, and that's, that's why people say, well, I'm just going to file for divorce. I'm just going to leave this job. I'm just going to leave this church. I'm just going to do, they want to bring quick closure to something. They want to bring quick closure. And I want to say to those that are listening, and I really feel led to say this, don't try to bring quick closure to your problem. Don't think, well, I'll just do this and it'll shorten the process and bring quick closure because God's got another problem waiting out there for you. He'll just let another one grow where that one disappears. <laughs> yeah, you don't get along with this wife, get divorced, yeah. God will bring you another I'll one. I'll tell you, if, if, if God is working through our trials, and he does, he does. If God is working through our trials to accomplish his purpose and we short circuit it by finding the nearest escape hatch and jump out of this, well, he'll just put us in the The next situation. job, you're going to find the boss tough again, <laughs> probably. Right. Or a different kind of thing. Or a different, yeah, it may not be the and same thing. it may thing. be it's something you not prefer. I mean, God wow. put me in, church, in a church that was declining, and he used that to bring me to the place of brokenness and absolute surrender. Well, I, I'm thankful it wasn't one of my children dying that he used, or you, you know what I'm but saying. But you, know, you, don't, yeah, you have no idea. And, yeah. and that's, you know, so just trust him, just whatever trust your him. circumstance is. So it's about trust, isn't it? It's all about trust. Well, we need to take a little break here. We'll come back and, and talk to Steve uh, further right after this break. Our failure to overcome sin is directly related to our identity, or rather, our lack of identity. Join us for the next program and hear about how we can block out the enemy's report of who we are and tune in to the truth. Too many of us have let other people define us. We've let the world define us. We've let our circumstances define us, but the reality is it must be our Father who defines us. And He has very clearly in His Word told us who we are.